scripture doesn't just contain passages regarding salvation, which we are very grateful for God's guidance and, and, and clear instruction on how it is that we can be saved, and just contain passages regarding our salvation and passages regarding the law, what God expects of us, what God wants for us. Scripture also contains what is known as wisdom literature. What is wisdom? Well, wisdom, a very brief definition of it is as follows, is that wisdom is the ability to make godly choices in life, which is very important because there are times when we just need practical advice for how to deal with certain situations, certain things, and also how to deal with certain kinds of <clears throat> people. We are starting a brand new series called People. Ugh. And some of you, you can immediately relate. And some of you, you saw that, yep. I've been waiting for this sermon my whole life because there are some people that you just need some godly wisdom on how do I deal, I mean, I know how to deal with all these people, but then there's that one person, like how do I deal with, with him? Morning. Amazing, will you stand as we go before the Lord with worship this morning? Oh, is anyone tired today? <laughs> or like tired of being hot? Yesterday I said, oh, I'm ready for Christmas. Oh, no. <laughs> it's coming. Anyway, uh, hear this word from Psalm 37 this morning that calls us into worship. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn your justice like the noonday. That is good news this morning that we can trust on our God, trust in our God to act and to move on our path. So let's sing together.
Justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. So come, oh, let justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. Come on, we surrender. King of all generations, let every tongue and nation surrender all to you alone. King of all generations, let every tongue and nation surrender all to you alone. Sing that chorus together one more time. So come, move, let justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Good evening and welcome to Harvester Online. I'm Pastor Jen and I'll be with you all night tonight. And tonight we, well, first of all, we welcome back Pastor Jason who's been out for a couple of weeks taking a European vacation. Uh, he'll, he'll mention it a little bit and uh, at the beginning of the sermon, so uh, be listening for that. He did have a good time. I actually got to talk to him a little, little earlier today. But there were lots and lots and lots of crowds everywhere. And, um, and so, you know, he was kind of reminded that people sometimes are annoying. We don't, we don't always like the other people uh, in, our, in the human race, right? Um, people, people are just sometimes hard to get along with for whatever reason. Sometimes it's for good reasons, sometimes it's for bad reasons. Um, but there are some people that just rub us the wrong way, I believe. And that's, that's what this series is about. What to do with the people who, for whatever reason, they just kind of rub us the wrong way. And today we're going to be starting with critical people. And this one kind of hits me a little bit because I've always been accused of being a pretty critical person. Now, today, my boss would absolutely tell you that that is not the case and he couldn't imagine that, that it ever was. Even though there's a situation at work, there's a person at work who's one of those people who just rubs me the wrong way and I constantly catch myself talking about her and talking negatively about her. That's, that's an attitude that I have to work on and that's kind of what this, this series is about and this sermon is about. So yeah, this is one of those practical sermons that we all have to kind of pay attention to and find out find out and put into practice some of the things that Pastor Jason will say. So get ready to take some notes and we will see you at the end of the service. From Ecclesiastes 7, 5. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the songs of fools. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Would you please, no, sorry. <laughs> oh, you missed me, didn't you? No, you, I don't know. All of my nonsense. It's so good to see you. Um, we did have a wonderful vacation, um, and uh, my kids survived me, and so congratulations to them. And uh, the staff survived my absence, so congratulations to them. Um, well, they mostly survived. So um, today we are starting a brand new series called People. Ugh. And some of you, you can immediately relate. And some of you, you saw that, yep, I've been waiting for this sermon my whole life, right? Some of you, you even uttered those words on the way to church while you're driving, you know? Or maybe you went, maybe when you saw your spouse, you uttered those words this morning. I don't know. But some of you, you can relate. Just the thought of people irritates you, right? 
It just irritates you. Like, you're like, oh, I want to go to church, but there's people there, right? I want to go to the restaurant, but there's people there, you know? People, right? People. Anyways, my, my family and I, um, we, we just got back from our, uh, our trip. We went over to Europe, for those who didn't know. We went over there, and uh, it was an amazing trip, but there was literally people everywhere. I mean, everywhere that we went, and at times, it was impossible to move. I mean, it was, seriously, at times, we were, we were barely, like, inching along. Like, when we were in the Vatican, we went, to, we went to Rome, went to Vatican, and so we're like, oh, that's nice. It's still nice. 30 minutes later, yep, still looking, that's pretty amazing. I mean, we're just barely inching along, and it is so crowded over there that literally right now, they're saying, tourists, go home. Thank you, but no thank you. Keep your dollars and, and, and whatever currency you have. Just stay home. Don't come over here because we can't drive. We can't, we can't get a, a hotel room. We can't go anywhere. We can't even move about. We are barely inching along. And even right before we went over to Barcelona, there was actually a group that was going around squirting uh, tourists with water pistols because it's tourist season. Like there's like duck season and deer season. So they were squirting. To go. Anyway, so we, we survived. Um, no one was mean or cruel or told us to go home. We actually had a great trip. But, but literally, there was people every, everywhere that we went. And people, ugh, right? So the good news is that Scripture doesn't just contain passages regarding salvation, which we are very grateful for God's guidance and, and, and clear instruction on how it is that we can be saved, and just contain passages regarding our salvation and passages regarding the law, what God expects of us, what God wants for us. It doesn't just contain deep theological things like questions that we can wrestle with about all kinds of things like eschatology and stuff like that. It doesn't just contain things like, like parables and the gospel accounts. Scripture also contains what is known as wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. So, so what is that? What is wisdom? Well, wisdom, a very brief definition of it is as follows, is that wisdom is the ability to make godly choices in life, right? So God's Word, it contains for us directions on how to make godly decisions for life, which is very important because there are times when we just need practical advice for how to deal with certain situations, certain things, and also how to deal with certain kinds of <clears throat> people, right? Certain kinds of people, right? Because there are some people that you just need some godly wisdom on how do I deal? I mean, I know how to deal with all these people, but then there's that one person. Like, how do I deal with, with him or how to deal with her? How, how do I deal with, with difficult people? God wants us to know how to handle people, and so he gives us wisdom literature that provides guidance, wisdom on how to handle certain situations, certain people in, in life. In particular, in today's message, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what God's word, what, what God's wisdom has to say with how to deal with critical people. Because there's all kinds of people out there, and, and one type of people that you will probably run into eventually are people who are critical. That's their, their spirit. Like when, when God was passing out spiritual gifts, they got the spiritual gift of criticism. Like they can just like, like they walk in the room like, oh, that, I don't like that. And I don't like that. And I don't like that. And I don't like her. And I don't like him. And I don't like that. And this should be like this. It should be like that. And, I, and they just criticize. They criticize all kinds of things. So how do you say that you know someone who is very, very, very critical? You know someone like that. Just by a show of hands, you, you don't know. I, I like, there's some people I'd love to introduce you to right? There are some people I would love to just introduce and like let you get to experience the critical, right? So, so, so some of you, you know, many hands going over, you know people critical. And now how many of you are sitting next to, no, don't raise your hand. Like don't, 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 don't raise that because I don't want any fights breaking out. My counseling schedule is already backed up two weeks from being gone, all right? So the truth of the matter is that we, we deal with, with difficult people all the time. And some of the difficult people that we have to deal with, they have the spiritual gift of criticism, of being able to see the bad and all kinds of things, and then letting you know about it and expecting you to do something about it, even if you have no expertise in changing the matter, right? So, so people are going to criticize us and criticize things around us. They're also going to criticize us for what we do, and they're going to criticize us for what we are not doing. In fact, would you just say this out loud with me? Everybody say, I will... Be criticized. Be criticized. Oh, that sounded so good, didn't it? Right? Amen. Let's pray. Let's go home, right? I will. Say it again one more time. I will, I will. Be, criticized. be criticized. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? I mean, that's, that's just the reality of life. In this life, you are going to be 
criticized. I'm going to be criticized, and it's going to happen. And, and in fact, all throughout Scripture, you see people who are being criticized. We're not alone in this. If you've been criticized, if you can experience the, the criticism of those who have the spiritual gift of being able to pick apart any and everything, just know this, you're not the first one to endure those kinds of things. In fact, in the Old Testament, Moses, he was criticized for all kinds of things. He was criticized for the, 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 the woman that he chose to marry. He got all kinds of pushback from his family members. He was criticized by his own brother and sister for who he chose to, to marry. He was criticized, of all things, for leading his people out of slavery, right? You'd think that would be a good thing, and they'd be very grateful and appreciative, but no, they, they, they kept saying to him, we wish that we were back in Egypt. Why'd you bring us out here in the wilderness to die? Just take us back. Take us back to slavery. They, they criticized him for, for, for leading them out of slavery. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he, he, incur, he encountered all kinds of criticism in his ministry, right? He was criticized for, for, for being a hypocrite at times. He was criticized for not being a good teacher. He was criticized for being too short. He was, being criticized, he was criticized for not being much to look at. He was criticized for being more impressive in his letters than he was behind the pulpit, right? Like, like Paul, you're really good at writing stuff down, but when you come and you deliver it, it's, it's, not, that, it's not that good, right? Your, your preaching's not that, that great, right? It's not that, it's not that effective. Jesus, the Son of God, he was also criticized, right? He hangs out with the wrong kinds of people, right? He, he eats with tax collectors. He befriends sinners and drunkards. And of all things, he heals on the Sabbath, right? He heals people on the Sabbath. And in fact, even his own disciples criticized him at times. One time Jesus actually had to say to one of his 12, uh, get thee behind me, Satan, right? Because he's being criticized for how he, is, he was moving along in ministry and his disciple didn't agree with that, that kind of, of thinking. He was criticized from even his own inner circle. So everybody say it again. I will be criticized, right? That's what's going to happen. You're going to be criticized in this life, and I'm going to be criticized. Now, I'm sure you've never criticized me, right? Because I'm, I'm perfect. We all know that. I never mess up. I never make bad decisions. Even through COVID, every decision I made throughout all of COVID, it was the perfect decision, right? It was, it was the best possible scenario. Every, no, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to, we're going to, and, and things are going to happen, and we're going to be criticized. So, so the question we have to wrestle with is, how does God want us to handle criticism? In particular, how does God want us to, to wisely deal with, with critical people that are in our lives? Because the reality is, is that you're going to have to deal with with some very, very critical people. Now, now, not here. I mean, not here because all the critical people, they don't, they don't go to church here. They go to church across town. But you're going to come across some critical people. So how, how does God want us to wisely handle criticism? Well, here, here are three wise biblical ways to handle criticism and critical people. Here, here's the first thing you need to know. That the first thing is this, is you need to know is that there is a time to listen. Because you're not going to want to listen. The criticism at times. At times you're like, la, 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 la. Right? That's, that's, that's what, what a lot of people do. Like, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to process this. I'm tired. I'm irritable. I'm hangry. I'm whatever. I don't want to listen to whatever. If it's going to be ne bad or negative, I don't want to hear it, right? Because we kind of get to that point in our life where we just don't want to hear any negative feedback or anything like that. But, but just know this. There is, there's a, a wise way at times to handle criticism, and that wise way at times, not at all times, but at times, is to know this, there's a time to listen. To just settle yourself down and just kind of soak in what it is that they're, they're telling you, right? Now, how do we know? How do we know when instead of going, la, 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 when instead of doing that, how do we know when to listen to criticism? Well, here's a couple of practical thoughts, the biblical thoughts. The first one is this, is you want to listen to even critical people whenever their motive is to help and not hurt, because be, different people have different motives whenever they bring you their, their criticisms, right? Whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's at church, or wherever you find yourself. When, when people come to you with their criticisms, sometimes their motives are just outright to hurt you. They want to make you as miserable as they, as they possibly can because they're a miserable person and they want the rest of the world to be miserable with them. But there are some people, however, who will come to you with, with criticisms and their motive is not to hurt you, but is rather it is to help you or to help the ministry or whatever it is that you're trying to move forward in. For instance, let's say you're struggling with, of all things, everybody's favorite subject, weight, right? 
Maybe you're struggling with, with your weight. And, and maybe there's a person who comes up to you and they say to you, hey, there, there's a, a buy one, get one free thing at the gym that I go to this month. And w- would you like to go and work out with me? Would you like to go and I've been looking for, I've been looking for uh, someone to help spot me and uh, to help me and, and just encourage me. And, uh, and would, you, would you come to, come to the gym with me? We've got a, it's a buy one, get one free kind of, come, come join me at the gym. Now, that, that person probably wants to help you and not hurt you as opposed, as opposed to, to someone who comes to, up to you at a church potluck and says, hey, you better not eat that Oreo thing because you're starting to look like a potato. Now, I say that because, just so you know, that happened to me. (laughs) True story. And it happened at Waynesville. First Sunday dinner, it wasn't the Tarangos. It could have been, but it wasn't the Tarangos, right? It's a tradition there. Every first Sunday was first Sunday dinner. And so the preacher had no choice. You're going to gain 50 pounds when you went to church there, whether you liked or not, because you had to test everybody's dish. And Did you like my thing, Pastor? Oh, it was a mess, the best thing I ever had. And when you're doing that week after week after month after month for, for, for 11 years, you're going to gain some weight. And so they say things like, you better not eat the Oreo thing, Pastor, because you're starting to look like a potato with your little arms sticking out. It doesn't. Their, 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 their goal is not to help you, but let's be clear, that person was trying to hurt me. <laughs> They've since gone on to heaven, I think. I think. <laughs> so so I'm, just, I'm just saying their motive was probably not pure. I'm not sure about all their other motives in life. But anyways, there are some people who want to hurt you and not help you, and, and, and you may not want to listen to them, but those in your life that are trying to help you, it would be wise, it, it would be wise to listen to them. Because there are people in your life who have great wisdom to give you, and, and you may not understand, and you may not be there yet, you may not have it all figured out, but if you would just take time to stop and listen to what it is that they're trying to speak to you, the, the truth in love that they're trying to tell you, you might be able to change course and, and save, save your, your, your ministry, to save your marriage, to save whatever it is they're trying to help steer, maybe even to save your life from, from one more, from the consequences of one more dessert, right? So, so their motive... If it's pure, you're going to want to listen to them when they want to help you and not hurt you. So, so what else? You want to listen whenever the person actually can help you, okay? Because there are some people that want to help you, but they don't have advice that's going to help you, right? And so you're probably not going to want to listen to the person who's trying to help you, but they have no godly wisdom to actually give to you. They might be actually steering you in a very, very bad path. So you want to listen whenever their motive is to help and not hurt, and when they actually have something to tell you that can help you get on the right path. You want to listen when the person is offering constructive criticism that is knowledgeable, and they have some experience that can help you get on the right track instead of pushing you towards the wrong track when they actually can help you. In Proverbs chapter 15, another wisdom passage, verses 31 to 32, it says this. It says, it says that if you listen, because there's, there's a time to listen, right? And, and, and some of us are not going to want to listen because we, we think we know everything and we think that we're, we've got, got it all figured out. But, but friends, there are some things that no matter how long you've been on the journey, you, just, you, you haven't quite got it all figured out yet. And maybe there's someone who can help get you on the, on the right or a better path. If, it's conditional, right? If you listen to constructive criticism, you'll be at home among the wise. But if you reject discipline, you will only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you will grow and understanding. So no matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been on this, this journey of faith, there are some people who can come alongside in your life and they want to help you and not hurt you, and they actually can help you if you would just take time to listen to what it is that they have to say to you. There's a time to listen to constructive criticism, and I would argue that today that, that so many people in the church and in life in general are not maxing out their, their, their potential in whatever it is that they're doing in life because they've not learned the art of listening. They're too busy talking, or they're too busy being offended, or they're too busy at, at whatever that they, they refuse to listen to constructive criticism from people who want to help them and not hurt them and who actually can help them if they would just let them help them in life. In my life, there, there are a lot of people that, that, that want to help me and not hurt me and actually can help me if I would listen to them. My, my spouse has wonderful godly wisdom to give to me, and I would be wise to listen to her. My kids, 
Yes, even my kids. They have godly wisdom. Dad, you shouldn't tell that joke. Dad, you shouldn't do this. Dad, you, you, do you realize how you're coming? What do you mean? Sometimes your own family members, sometimes even your own kids, though you don't want to listen to them, you want to do to them what they did to you when they were little, sometimes your own children can offer some of the best godly wisdom because they know you best. They know even when you're, like the times when, when my daughter has come up to me and said, Dad, why are you faking it at church? I don't want to listen to that. I'm not faking it. You're faking it. We mean I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting on a mask or whatever. Listen to your children. My parents. Oh, my parents. Hi, Mom and Dad. I know you're watching because I said your name, right? That, that's, they have this amazing ability. Whenever I mention my mom or dad, somehow they turn it on and they, and they watch. Like, we heard what you said about us, Jason, right? And so anyways, my parents have godly wisdom and be very wise for me to, to listen to because of experiences that can help me. My, my staff. Yes, my, my staff, they're like, hey, you know, I wouldn't go with that, Jason, I wouldn't go with that, that sermon. Jade made me change my whole sermon title for the month of December, and I'm very upset about it right now. But, but she's probably got some wisdom that maybe I don't want to go with. The, it, was, it was about touching your neighbor, and she said, I don't know if that sounds right. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I, said, I, mean, I had come up with a better idea for how we reach out to our community, because that's the whole big Nazarene emphasis right now. Maybe touch my neighbor is not the right word to use, so... Maybe you listen to your staff, my district superintendent, he has wonderful godly wisdom that he imparts to me on a regular basis. Hey, Jason, when you consider this, or hey, have you thought about this? These are all people in my life who want to help me and not hurt me, and who actually can help me if I would listen. And the same is true for you. There are people in your life who want to help you and not hurt you, and you will want to listen to them when they have godly wisdom and advice to give to you that can help you and get you on the right track. In order for you to max out, for you to become the best at what God is calling you to be, you'd be wise to let iron sharpen iron in your life. As one person in your life helps to, to, to sharpen you and you help to sharpen them as well, learn to listen to those who can and will constructively criticize you and help you become a better person in the days ahead. So how do you deal with critical people? Well, just know this. There's a time to listen to them. And I hope you will do that, that you'll make space in your life to calm yourself down and not to always be offended and always be hurt and to always just, you know, but, but to, to stop and to listen to those who want to help you and not hurt you and actually can get you pointed in the right direction because they care about you, your life, your ministry, your work, your family, your weight, your whatever, right? So there is a time to listen. Second, there's also a time to answer. Sometimes you just sit there and you soak it all in. Yep, 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 uh-huh, I hear you, I hear you, uh-huh. Just know this, there's also a time when those who are, who are criticizing you and bring criticisms to you where you don't just kind of soak it all in, but you actually respond. You, you answer them, you, answer, you, you actually open your mouth and you, and you talk back to them. There's a time to listen, and there's also a time to answer criticism. There's a time to soak it all in, and there's time to respond and offer some type of defense to them to answer their criticism of you, of your work, your ministry, your family, or your weight, or whatever. When, so when, and I guess the question is, okay, preacher, but, but when, when is a godly, a wise time for us to answer? Well, here's a couple of wise and practical thoughts about when do you actually answer criticism. The first one is this, is when we answer criticism whenever the person is missing information, right? Whenever the person that is criticizing us is miss they don't know the whole story they don't know the whole picture they don't have they don't have all the information that they need to be they maybe they're criticizing you and they and they're completely off base and they and if they just knew this bit of information maybe just maybe they they would they would actually would change their mind and they wouldn't be they wouldn't be saying what they're they're, they're saying maybe 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 they're missing information that would change their perception of you or the situation or whatever. So, so for example, they may be criticizing you for, for whatever, and you would say, well, actually, here's, here's something that, that you, maybe you did, not, you did not know. And then you, you tell them something that they didn't, you didn't know. You say, hey, you know, we're, we're, how come Harvester never does any outreach? Well, well did, did you know we're actually we're, just, we're starting the, the Harvester Leagues, and we're, we're already we got a whole bunch of family communities that are going to be gathering here on our campus, and did, and did you know about Fall Fest, and did you, and did you know about this, the, this other thing, and, 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 and did, did, you, did you know about these things? Oh, I, I didn't know we were doing those things, right? And maybe just there's some information that's missing that would change the perception, right? And say, wow, I, I didn't know, but, but now I understand. I just, I didn't I didn't know. You offer them information they did not previously have. And can I tell you that, that a lot of criticism 
not here at Harvest, but I'm just saying in, in general in the church world, right, that a lot of criticism that, that, that pastors, that, that staff members receive is because of a lack of information. There's a bit of information that would change perception, that would change the, 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 the narrative or the story or the criticism, but that information is lacking. There's, a, there's, a, there's an information gap that would change the criticism that's being dealt out or being received. Now, the question is, whose fault is that, right? And, and, and I, and I, and I want to let you know that the answer is both. Whenever there is criticism between, between pastor and, and congregation, between staff and congregation, and, and there's a lack of information, whose fault is it? The answer is the fault is oftentimes it's both. The truth is, is that we as a staff is that we can and we need to do a better job of proactively providing information and doing it over and over. We have to over-communicate to help get the information out. In church, there are also times when, when maybe, just maybe, you could do a little bit better job of listening. Well, I didn't know about blah, blah, blah. Well, we, we, we said it from the, the announcements, and it was in the bulletin, and it's on our website, and on our Facebook page. Well, why, you didn't tell me. Well, I, I know I didn't, like, grab you and, like, you know, like, by the shoulders and look you in the eye and say, hey, did you know we're having an ice cream turnoff? Well, since when? Well, it's been on the calendar for, like, months. What do you mean you didn't? You know, I would have I made an ice cream, but if you didn't invite me. Yes, we've been inviting you for months. So please, just come eat our ice cream. I didn't know. I would come, but I didn't, I didn't know, right? There are times when, when maybe, just maybe, we could do a better job of providing information and maybe you could do a better job of listening or reading or maybe even asking probing questions in love, saying, hey, I got a question about, like, we're, we're doing Fall Fest this year because I haven't, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's August and I haven't, you know, are we, we are doing Fall Fest, right? You know, I just, I just want to double check. As opposed to, why aren't we doing fall fit? Well, actually, we are. I mean, just hold on. We'll tell you all about it. The announcement's coming out next week. I promise. I promise. It's just, it's just, we have a schedule when we release information, right? And so ask the questions in love, right? So, so when else? When else do you answer criticism? Well, you answer the criticism whenever the person is open to change. Because some people aren't, right? You, you answer when, when people, when they, they're perhaps missing information that would change their mind, and you, and you provide that, but you, you, you also answer whenever they're actually open, open to change. And only if they're open to change. Because some people, quite honestly, no matter what you say, no matter how many words, no matter how beautiful, eloquent the words you provide and the explanation that you offer for, for why it is the way it is, they're still going to be critical. And you're not going to change their mind. All you're going to do is waste your time, waste their time, and you're just going to get frustrated because you're trying to explain something to them that they're never, never, ever going to get because they don't want to get. And for those people, friends, can I just lovingly say, don't even try to answer them. Don't. Sometimes you just have to, mm-hmm. And nod your head and say, and Lord bless you, and walk off, right? Because there's no point in trying to even defend yourself. For example, there, there are people in my life <laughs> that think that preachers only work one day a week. Now, none of you, I'm saying there are people in my life. I didn't say my church family. I said, there are people in my life that, that think that preachers only work one day a week. That's going to be the best job ever. Well, go ahead and apply, okay? I'm just telling you, just go ahead and apply, right? They think the rest of the time we're just sitting around and, you know, hanging out and, you know, and, and so we're, you know, and as a result, they're, they're very critical of all the things that they think that we should be doing or that we're not doing or, or whatever because they don't know that behind the scenes, oftentimes, we're doing lots and lots of counseling and funerals and weddings and writing Bible studies and serving the community and dealing with other critical people and putting out fires and serving on the district and serving the general church and serving, running, 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 running and and, and just going a thousand miles an hour and sometimes as you're going a thousand miles an hour things fall into the cracks right and, and they don't know all the other things that we do besides when we're up up front they don't know that their expectations of us are not the same as the expectations of other members of the church family as well let me say it like this let's just pretend that the Tarangos have one certain expectation for what a pastor should be like, right? And then the Welches have just one particular expectation of what a pastor should be like. And then just, let's say the, the Roberts have just one particular, right? And, you, and, 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 and though no one family or even one individual's expectations of, of how a pastor should be and what they should do and how they should spend their time, well, he should just spend most of his time praying. 
No, 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 he should spend most of his time visiting. No, 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 he should spend most of his time writing sermons. No, 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 he should spend most of his time reaching out to community. No, no, he should be spending most of his time. And while no one individual person or family's expectations are unreasonable, when you combine all the expectations, that's when it becomes completely unattainable and unrealistic. And that's true not just for the senior pastor, it's also true for the worship pastor, the youth pastor, the, the outreach pastor, for, for, for any one of us. It includes the ministries that you serve in as well. Anyways, for some people, if you try to answer their criticism with additional information, it's going to change their, their mind. But for others, they're not going to change their mind no matter what you say, and so it's utterly pointless to even try to offer that rebuttal to them. Don't waste your time and your precious energy because you've only got so much in life on trying to answer people who are not going to change their minds about you and your ministry and, and your, your, your work or, or your, your family or whatever it is that they're criticizing you about, okay? So let's look at a story in the Old Testament where we see a person answering critics because there's a time, there's a time to listen, there's also a time to, to answer. And here's an example of one time when a, when a person is answering a critic in, in Scripture and does so very, very wisely. And it's found in the book of Judges, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says that the, that the Ephraimites, they asked Gideon, why have you treated us like this? Why, why didn't you call us when you went to, to fight Midian? And, and the scripture says this. It says, and they, and they what? They criticized him. How? Because you're, in this life, I will be criticized. Gideon was criticized. You're going to be criticized. We're all going to face criticism. And, and so he, he receives this criticism, and then he actually answers them. And so what did he do? They, they criticized him sharply. What did Gideon do? The, the scripture says he didn't just shut down and go into the corner and cry. No, verse 2 says, but he went and he answered them. That's what he did. He, he received their criticism, and then he went and he answered them. Gideon gave a defense. And, and as he did, as he answered them, Gideon built them up. He encouraged them. And he said, he said you guys, he said, actually, you guys, you are, you're, you're awesome. And, and I'm amazed by all the things that you do. And, and, and in fact, everything you've done, it just, I'm like, what I've done in life, it, it, it pales in comparison to what you have accomplished. And he just kind of puffed them up and encouraged them. And, whatever, and he provided information that they did not have about how he felt about them. Like, oh, you're right. We are pretty amazing. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And, and just... He answered them, and then, like, and then the scripture says, verse 3 says, that their resentment against him subsided. They changed their minds. There are some people who will criticize you, even criticize you sharply, and you provide them information that they don't know. Maybe the information that they don't know is how great you think that they are. And you just simply tell them, you know what? You're right, but you're amazing. You're amazing. You would never make that mistake. You're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing. And it will change their mind, and then their resentment against you will subside. Right? It may not fix the problem, but maybe they'll just at least they'll stop criticizing you, right? Getting diffused the conflict by answering the critique, and there's a time in life for us to do that. There's a time for us to listen, and there's a time for us also to answer a response. Are you with me so far? So what do you do with critics? Sometimes we listen, and we're just, mm-hmm, 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 mm hmm yeah, you're right. And we process it, and we, and we make the change. Sometimes there's a time to respond, you listen to what they're saying, and you provide them some information they don't have, and if they're willing to change, you provide that, and it can, you can actually change their perception or their understanding of you or the situation or whatever. And here, here's the third thing. What do we do with, what do we do with critics in our life? Here, here's, the, here's the critical people. Here's, this one's very, very hard. It's always saved for the last, right? Because this way you, you don't shut down immediately. You're like, oh, I'm going to never do that. And so we save it for the last. Save, save the hardest for last. You ready? When, pe when people are criticizing us, there's also time to, number three, Dismiss. Well, that, that sounds really, I don't know if I like that, right? There's a, there's a time, there's a time to, to listen, there's a time to respond, and there's a time to go, la, 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 la. You have permission from your pastor to do that. Now, don't actually do that, but just, like, pretend like when they're talking, just go ahead and, like, you know, metaphorically, put your fingers in the ear and go, no, 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 and just, and you can put the biggest smile on your face, whatever. You don't have to listen to what they're saying, right? You, you don't have to hear a thing they're saying. You, you, there's a time to actually dismiss certain people. Now, now, I would never dismiss any of you, but I'm just saying that there are times in life when, when you listen, there are times you respond, and there's times you smile, and you're going, la, 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 the whole time that they're talking. We must learn to dismiss invalid criticism, and this is so very, very important, yet it's so very, very hard for us to do. It's so very, very difficult. Now, when do we do it? When do we dismiss criticism? 
So a couple of wise and practical thoughts if you're taking notes, because I'm not just making this up. You can actually do this, okay? Here's the first thing. We dismiss criticism whenever the person who is making the criticism is always negative. There's a time dismiss, and and one of the times we dismiss negative criticism is when the person who is offering the negative criticism is always negative. Whenever they walk up, they're like, it's going to be a negative, it's going to be a negative, it's going to be a negative. I knew it was going to be negative. And you can dismiss that because you know before they even come and they start talking to you that whatever they have to say, it's going to be bad. I give you permission right now from the pulpit, go ahead and dismiss them even as they're walking up to you. Yep, it's going to be bad, going to be bad. I didn't even hear a word you said, right? Or you get a little letter, and then they send you a letter, and then you, you, you go to the bottom, and you see it signed by them, and you're like, yep, not even going to read that letter. Because I know, I know before I even read it, why, what's the point of me reading this? It's going to only hurt me, and it's going to bring me down, and it's going to be uh, accusatory and attacking, and it's just going to deflate me, and it's going to get me, it's going to depress me, and I'll just go ahead, and you're like, oh, well, we're going to file 13, and then uh, it's, it's, it just dismiss it. Some of you, you know people like that, that everything that comes out of their mouth is always, always negative. And, there, and I know that because you're, I saw little bubbles pop above your head. As I said, there are certain people who always are negative. And, you're like, and their name just went boop. And you're like, oh, yeah. I know that person, right? I know that person, right? Now, now some of you, some of you are like, hey, that's kind of rude. Like, you might be that person. You might be like, well, I can't believe he didn't listen to a thing I said. I've, he's been going to church here for five years, and I just realized the pastor's not listening to a word. Is it? Nope, I've not been listening for five years. I, I figured out in the first month. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm in so much trouble. You should never let me go on vacation because this is what happens when I come back, right? <laughs> No, I, I mean, I know that no one, no one here is like that because all the over, I already said all the overly critical people go to church someplace else. But, but I'm just saying that if you know someone like that in your life, you have permission to dismiss their criticism even before it comes out of their mouth because what do they have to say is going to be negative. And I guarantee it's not coming from God because that's not, that's not, those are not godly words. If, if, every, if everything coming in their mouth is always negative, they're being influenced by someone and it's not God, Okay. If everything that a person has to say is always critical and negative and harsh and cutting, just know this, their words are not from Jesus. They're coming from someplace else, and I'll give you a hint from where it's coming from. Don't, don't give the devil the permission to get inside your head through their voice or through their letters or their emails or whatever because they're going to they're gonna criticize everything. I don't, I don't like your doing with this, and I don't like my job, and I don't like my boss, and I don't like your boss, and I don't like my parents, and I don't like your parents, and I don't like the price of gas, and I don't like summer, and it's too hot, and I don't like winter because it's too cold, and I don't like the service. The sermon was too short, and then it was too long, and there's everything good on TV, and my burger is burnt, and my rolls are burnt, and now my rolls are undercooked, and, da, 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 and everything is bad. My ice cream turned off. Why can't we have a veggie turn off, right? Because, you know, we're all looking like potatoes around here. Uh. I mean, there's some people that are just negative about everything. You can't win. And so, friends, listen up. We dismiss criticism that comes from those who can't see the godly good in anything, including you. Why? Because they're not going to see anything good in you no matter what you do. Learn to dismiss their nonsense and their negativity. And and don't allow their negative disposition to distract you from doing what God has called you to do in life whether it's at work, whether it's in your, your, your family, whether it's here at the church, whatever, whatever it is that they're constantly criticizing, don't allow their negative disposition to distract you from doing what God has called you to do in life. Okay? Amen? Some of you are there. Some of you are like, I don't know. I want to really, listen to what they have to say. I'm telling you, fine, but you're going to walk around like this all the time too. <laughs> My life's horrible. I can't do anything right. There's, you're doing a lot more right than you're doing wrong. You are. In spite of their criticism, you're doing so much more right than you're doing wrong. And the Lord is pleased. Second, when else do we, do we dismiss criticism? We dismiss criticism when, when the person is emotionally unhealthy. We, we dismiss whenever the, the person, when, whenever this, this harsh criticism is coming from someone who is emotionally unhealthy. Now, now, don't mishear me. I did not say dismiss the person, Okay. We, we love the person who is hurting and the person who is wounded. But we have to understand that when a person is hurt or when they're wounded, we have to remember. And one of the things I tell my staff over and over again is that hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. And so oftentimes, hurt people are going to hurt you, right? 
And maybe they're going through something. Maybe their marriage is going through rough times. Maybe they just got a divorce. Maybe they're hurting financially. Maybe their, their, their body is changing. And maybe they're physically, they're hurting everywhere. Like, oh, my back and my knee. And I just, oh, my life is horrible. Like, they just hurt everywhere. Maybe, maybe they're in constant pain. Maybe one of their kids that ran off. Or maybe their, one of their kids is doing something just really, really foolish in life. And they're just, they're just hurting and they're crushed by what they're going through. And hurt people will hurt people. And then their criticism oftentimes is likely not personal. You just happen to be an easy target at the moment. Merely a victim, perhaps maybe even a friendly fire, or merely a person who's being hit in the crossfire as they're going through whatever it is that they're going through. We dismiss criticism when it comes from those who are always negative, and we also dismiss people when it comes from those who are wounded or emotionally unhealthy. In fact, Jesus, he had to do this all the time. For example, in Scripture, there was this one instance where the Pharisees were offended by what Jesus said, and the Pharisees, they were criticizing Jesus all the time. And so on one particular day, he told a story about the Pharisees, and he compared them to a bunch of plants. And in Matthew 15, 13, Jesus said this. He said, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. And then he says this. He says, leave them. Other translations, Jesus says this. He says, ignore them. La, 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 la. Ignore them. Why? Because they are blind guides. And if a, a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. There are certain people in your life who are always negative or who are emotionally unhealthy whatever, for whatever reason that, that they're, they're emotionally healthy in, in the moment. And, and if you listen to them, if you, if you soak it in what it is they're trying to tell you, not only will they, they hurt you and cut you, but that, that blind guide will then lead you in a place of darkness and you're both going to end up in a pit. They're already in that pit. And they're going to drag you in that pit too. And so you're going to be miserable and in dark places and you're going to have a hard time seeing the light or seeing the good in anything because you've allowed them to drag you down to where they are. And Jesus says it's better just to ignore them, to dismiss them, to walk away. Please understand this. Please listen carefully. This is important. As you become more and more effective and in whatever it is that you're doing in life, you become a bigger and bigger target for all kinds of criticism. Thus, if you are effective at work, or if you have an effective marriage, or if you're an effective leader in the community, if you have an effective ministry, whatever it is, whenever you become more and more effective, and as you rise in your influence, you become a greater and greater target for all kinds of criticism. And there are going to be times you're going to have to listen, there are times you're going to have to respond, and there's going to be times you're just going to have to dismiss it and walk away and say, I didn't hear a word they had to say because I already knew before they opened their mouth what was going to come out of their mouth. Let me say it like this. If you only have influence over 10 people, there's a good chance four of them are going to disagree with you. Good chance. You've got influence over 10 people, there's a good chance four of them are like, I don't like that choice you just made, right? I don't, I don't like it at all. It, 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 and so you're going to be criticized by those four because they think that maybe you should have done something else. You might be praised by their six, but those, those four might like, and it would be very tempting to just allow those, those four to drag you down into a dark place because they don't like what you're doing. If you have influence over 20 people, there's a good chance that eight of them are going to disagree with the choices that you're making. If you have influence over 200 people, it's a good chance that 80 of them are going to criticize whatever it is you're doing because they don't, they don't agree. And so let me say it like this. Let's pretend that later this year, we're going to change the carpet in the sanctuary. Two choices. I know, I know, I know you love them off. It's okay. It'll be okay. We're going to go with either gray or blue. It's got, it's got, it's got to be gray or blue. Who wants gray? Okay, who wants blue? Who's mad about both choices? <sighs> I can't win, right? <laughs> right? That's, that's how it goes. Like, you're, you're not going to be able to please everybody. Now we're just talking about carpet. Like, I can't believe we chose that. I want you to know this. this that, once again, this literally happened to me in my life as a pastor, not here at Waynesville, I had a board member that came up to me. We had this red carpet in there, and they didn't have shades on their windows. And because they didn't have shades on their windows, all the, the carpet was fading. And in 1979, whenever they built the sanctuary with this beautiful, bright red, bleeding red, uh, God bless America, red uh, carpet that they had in pews there, it was beautiful and pristine. But by, by, night, by 2005, it had turned pink. It faded. And so like, well, we probably should change the carpet here. And I had one of my board members at the time come up to me, cornered me in the basement of the church, and said to me, Pastor, just know this, I will never attend a church that does not have red carpet. If you change this carpet from red to any other color, I will not go because that is the Lord's color for worship. 
I'm, I don't, I have, I have a board, I mean, the rest of your board members are voting too, like, I don't, I'm not a dictator, like, you understand that, the, the, that in the church of Nazarene, we have a Presbyterian form of government, which means I don't have all the power, what do you mean, you're like, we're coming after me, like, I, I can't make that a choice to change the color, but any, anyways, right, you will be a target of criticism, and the only way to avoid being a target of criticism is as your influence grows, because the more people you know and the more people you influence, the more opportunities there is going to be for criticism, because the more decisions that you're making on a daily basis, the only way to not be a target of criticism is to go and, be in, and live on an island of one. And some of you, that won't even work for you because you're your own worst critic, okay? And that's a whole other sermon. So friends, if you don't learn to deal with it, to shake it off and move on, you're easily going to become distracted and you'll lose focus and you'll be ineffective in doing whatever it is that God has called you to do. You have to learn to dismiss it. And that's not easy. In fact, it's, it's super, super hard at times because sometimes you want to please people. In fact, the more that God has blessed my life and blessed my ministry, the more decisions that I've had to make, and, and both locally and also on a district level and a, and a general church level, and, 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 the, and the more that I've opened myself in those decisions up to harsh criticism. And every time that I've received those words, it, it hurts every single time. Every time it, it hurts deeply. But what I've had to learn to do is to quickly shake it off and not internalize it, and, and allow that person and their words to drag me into the ditch to be in darkness with them and the devil. And I hope that, I hope that our church staff sees that in me, that I've learned to, to let it go, to let it go, and to not treat that person any differently than I would if, than if they were always smiling and being pleasant around me. You've got a choice, and some of you right now, you're haunted by words that someone said to you years ago, and you've got to let their criticism go of you in your ministry and of your work and your marriage or whatever, you've got to let it go because it's been haunting you and you've not been able to let, you've got to let go. Not only that, but some of you, you're living, to try, you're, you're living right now to try, to try and please someone who's not even alive anymore and you're going to have to let it go. Some of you are absolutely driven by what other people think about you and you want everybody to like you. But friend, you're going to have to let it go because let me be blunt, they're not going to like you. Not everyone in this world is going to like you. In fact, if, if Jesus had 12 disciples and, 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 and one of those 12 uh, turned them over to be crucified, just know this, you've got a really good chance that one in 12 people around you would, would, would crucify you too. There are people that are not going to like you no matter what you do. They're going to be offended by your choices and your decisions, and, and they're, going, they're going to be a Judas to you. You've got a choice to make, and at times you're going to have to take the, the wise, godly wisdom of Taylor Swift. You've heard it, right? Shake, shake it off. Now, I don't know how you'll do that. I don't know how you'll shake it off. <laughs> you just listen to the song. You know, you're always like, you'll, you'll be fine, right? For me, I don't turn on Taylor Swift, okay? That's more of a them kind of thing over there. But for me, what I do is I, is I go find a safe place in the presence of God. That's what I do. And in that place, I, I examine my heart and I allow him to examine my heart and to examine my motives and my thought process and, and the decisions that I've made. And I say, God, if you're pleased with me, then I'm going to keep on going. And I'm going to keep on moving forward. And God, if you're not, would you, would you help correct me, rebuke me? Would you, what, Lord, whatever it is that you, you need me to do. And then I, I wait as I sit in his presence to hear his words whether they're words of comforting assurance of, yes, well done, my good and faithful servant, or whether it's Jason, you, you can do better. And sometimes I hear those words. And I have to go back to a person that offered the harsh critique. And I have to say, you know what, I'm so sorry. I've been doing some thinking and what you said, you know, you're right. You know, I, I hear what you're saying. and we'll, we'll do better next time. You can't please all people. And so there are times when you're going to have to learn to dismiss invalid criticism. Because if you don't, you will never become all that God wants you to be. As we close this morning, dealing with critical people, it's a part of life. We established at the very beginning, you will be criticized. I will be criticized, you're going to be criticized, we all will be. And at the end of the day, here, here's the key thought that I want you to take away from, from today in this message. I want you to internalize this, to, 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 to live with it, and let it become a part of you. Here's the key thought. We, we can't please everyone, but we can please God. Right? So there, there, there are some, some people, some situations, you just have to let it go. We can't please everyone, but we can please God. 
We cannot be driven by what other people think. We must learn to live for an audience of one. We must learn to live for our Heavenly Father and what it is that He thinks. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, this is what the Scripture says. It says, For we speak as messengers who have been approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose, what is our purpose, friends? Our purpose is to, help me out, church, please God, not, you have permission to dismiss them. La, 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 la. Because your, your goal is not to please them. Your purpose is to please God. Cling to that. Make that your goal. And one day you will hear those most important words ever. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on in. Enter into the heavenly rest that I prepared for you. Would you please stand? Our worship team is going to come and lead us in a closing song this morning. And as they come and lead us, I invite you into a time of response and prayer. Whether it is you want to come and pray at the altar, whether you want to pray right where it is where you're, where you're standing. But let us, let us just go before the Lord and ask him to, to help us to wisely handle the criticism that all of us will receive in life. Whether it's just to simply listen, whether it's to respond in those times, or whether it's to dismiss it. But whatever we do, we do make sure that in this life that we are living to please God and not people. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the blessing of your word, which gives us godly counsel for all sorts of things, not just for how to be saved and, and not just um, for issues regarding uh, what is to come, um, but Lord, also for the godly wisdom that you provide for daily situations, including how to handle um, criticism and critical people in our lives. I pray, God, that nothing that I, that I would have said today that it's, that's of me would, would be heard, but rather everything, Lord, that is of you and that is from you, that it would be heard by us today and that we would internalize that and we would allow it to become a part of our response in the days ahead as we receive uh, critical words from, from people around us. Help us, God, to live lives that are pleasing to you. And as a result, may we influence many others to come to faith in you as well. It's in Christ our Lord that we pray and ask all these things and God's people said.
hold out your hands and receive this benediction today, family. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he grant you strength to live through troubled times, to hear troubled words. May he fill you with grace that is equal to every need and peace that surpasses understanding. May he grant you wisdom and uh, discernment to love, to walk humbly, and to know when to talk and when to not. Love you guys. Have a blessed week. Well, the good news is I don't feel like I came out of this too singed. I, I looked at the notes earlier, and I knew that this was going to be one that was going to really hit me pretty hard. Because as I said in the intro, um, being critical is one of my spiritual gifts. And yeah, um, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to take away from that. But I, I, I don't think that I did as bad as I thought I was going to do. So congratulate me on that. So next week, we're going to continue this series. And I forgot what we're, uh, which people we're going to be looking at. But it's going to be another one of these wisdom, uh, wisdom uh, books. And it's going to be something else that's practical for the types of people that we interact with. So join us uh, next week at 8 o'clock Central on Thursday. And we'll see you then.